the Book of Romans, otherwise known as the Second Book of Greeks. Chapter 1 And there was another tribe of apes who called themselves Romans. The Romans learned how to make temples and monuments and inscriptions in stone and wars and slaves and money and were therefore civilized and believed that they had been chosen by the gods as the chosen tribe above all others, etc. Chapter 2 The Romans believed in doing things the easy way, like eating on couches and having a little urn next to the couch so they could make room for seconds without leaving the table, and wrapping themselves up in a single big sheet called a toga instead of wearing clothes, all of which saves time and resulted in the biggest Roman invention, which is called appropriating, and means taking something from somebody else, changing its name when nobody is looking, and then pretending it was yours all along. And so they appropriated as much as they could from the Greeks, like all the Greek gods and goddesses, and most of the Greek myths, and comedy and philosophy and history, especially history which has a way of happening all by itself, whether you do anything yourself or not. And also maybe not as much philosophy as comedy, because philosophy isn't easy, which is why the Romans actually had to make up some philosophy of their own to introduce the idea that if a thing isn't easy, it isn't worth doing at all. Chapter 3 But the Romans also knew that somebody had to do the work or it wouldn't get done at all because they certainly weren't going to do it which is why they invented two classes the patricians and the plebeians the patricians believed in democracy except for slaves not including women or plebeians and so set up a republic which means that everybody is free and has a vote unless you're a slave, or a woman, or a plebeian. The plebeians believed in what the patricians told them to believe in, because the first rule of being a plebeian is to be obedient, especially to the patricians, who must know, or why would they have all that money? Chapter 4 The Roman democracy had a senate, where all of the senators wore togas with purple edges and made great speeches to each other and to the consuls who were elected to run things. There were always two consuls because the Romans didn't believe in kings who had a habit of being untrustworthy, which the Romans didn't approve of at all since life gets difficult when you can't trust the king and life isn't supposed to be difficult, but easy. So the Romans elected two consuls so that they could keep an eye on each other and the patricians wouldn't have to do it. Chapter 5 But there was a lot to do, so the plebeians were kept pretty busy, building temples and monuments with stone inscriptions and so forth, all over the place, not to mention aqueducts and bridges and roads, so that the Roman legions could march out and conquer everybody who believed in the wrong gods or who believed in the right gods under the wrong names. And so it was that the Romans invented a very important new concept called division of labor, which worked very well. For example, the patricians would think up a huge engineering project and then the plebeians would build it. The patricians would think of somebody to have a war with and then the plebeians would fight it. And sometimes they would even do things the other way around For example, it often happened that the plebeians would make history and then the patricians would write it. Chapter 6 Thanks to division of labor, the Romans accomplished quite a lot. The patricians decided the world wasn't big enough for Rome and Carthage to be in it at the same time. So for the greater glory of Rome, the plebeians destroyed Carthage and killed their enemies and raped their women and sowed the fields of Carthage with salt, 
just to make sure. Because after that close call with Hannibal and the elephants crossing the Alps, it seemed easier to make sure. Chapter 7 When Carthage was no longer making things difficult, the Romans had it easy for a while, and it worked on the Roman culture, which couldn't be done by plebeians, and so it had to be done the easy way. But they did the best they could, all things considered, and wrote some pretty decent Greek plays and some pretty indecent Greek poems, as well as some new Greek myths, like the one about Aeneas, who escaped Troy in the general hilarity caused by the Trojan horse joke, and started wandering all over the place, something like Odysseus, in fact, a lot like Odysseus, only when he got home, Aeneas didn't kill all his wife's suitors, but founded Rome instead, which would make the Romulus and Remus thing sort of confusing if you thought about it, which is hard to do, and therefore contrary to Roman philosophy. Chapter 5 The Romans were also good at sculpture and painting, because they were very fond of looking at themselves, just the way they were. Whatever they happened to be doing, since it's so much easier that way. And so the Romans made sculptures that were not exactly beautiful, but real, including warts and so forth. And they painted sex scenes on the walls of Pompeii because it wouldn't do to forget how to have sex. And having huge colorful reminder all over the walls of a house makes it pretty easy to remember. Chapter 9 And things went on for quite a while this way, without much history going on. And life was good, which is to say easy, unless you happen to be a slave, or a plebeian, or not a Roman. Chapter 10 But history has a way of happening all by itself, whether you do anything yourself or not. And so it happened that democracy didn't work out, which shouldn't be too surprising since we all know what happened to the Greeks. But the Romans didn't worry too much about democracy in spite of what happened to the Greeks. After all, the Romans knew that they were the chosen tribe, and much more chosen than the Greeks had ever been, because all the Roman gods and goddesses said so, and they should know. Being pretty much the same gods and goddesses the Greeks believed in, except for the Roman god named Janus, who had two faces and was completely unknown to the Greeks for some reason, although nobody should be surprised to discover that the Greeks didn't know everything, because how could they have gotten the names of their own gods so wrong? What with Zeus really being Jupiter, and Hades really being Pluto, Poseidon really being Neptune, and Ares really being Mars, and Aphrodite really being Venus, and Hera really being Juno, and Artemis really being Diana, and Apollo really being Apollo, which just goes to show you, the Greeks weren't wrong about everything. Chapter 11 For example, the Greeks weren't wrong about how the chosen tribe needs to rule the whole world, which is why there was Julius Caesar, who was a consul for a while, and kept his eye on the other consul. This was good practice for the triumvirate, which means rule by three apes, and kept Julius pretty busy keeping his eye on Sulla and Pompey, until Pompey's head accidentally wound up on a pointed stick, and something else happened to Sulla, and Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon for some reason, and became dictator of Rome, which was when they stopped calling him Julius and started calling him Caesar, or even Mr. Caesar, which changed history. Chapter 12. In fact, Caesar was pretty interested in history, and spent most of his time making it, when he wasn't making it, he was writing it, to make sure they got it right. And so Caesar divided Gaul into three parts, and kept all three parts for himself, to make sure that nobody else could get any, which made it safer for him to leave town for a while, and conquer the Brits, and the Krauts, and the Spix, and the Gypsies, where he met Cleopatra in a rug, and the rest of the world too, pretty much the same way Alexander had done it, since Caesar knew a thing or two about appropriating himself. Chapter 13 And when he got back, the senators suspected that Caesar was ambitious for some reason. They thought he wanted to be emperor, which is much worse than being dictator for some reason. 
and so they stabbed him 22 times in the Ides of March, and once more just to make sure. And then they had a big war and buried Caesar and all his friends, including even Antony and Cleopatra, and finally made Augustus the Emperor of Rome, which made everything all better for some reason. Chapter 14 Augustus turned out to be a pretty good emperor, having discovered that if you don't start a war with your neighbors, you might not have to fight one, which made things really easy on the Romans for a while and made them pretty happy about Pax Romana, which means Roman peace, and proves that the Romans hadn't forgotten their invention called comedy. Chapter 15 In fact, for quite a long time after Augustus, the Romans specialized in comedy, having discovered that it's pretty easy to be funny when you have an emperor who is a living god with absolute power over everybody, including the patricians. Chapter 16 For example, there was an emperor named Tiberius who invented syphilis and went insane, and thought it would be pretty funny if Caligula became emperor, which was absolutely right. Chapter 17 Caligula had a great sense of humor and thought it would be extremely funny to have everyone killed for no reason, which he did until his friends decided to have a last laugh, which they did, after which Claudius became emperor, so that everyone could stop laughing for a minute and catch their breath. Chapter 18 When they saw that emperors were so much funnier than democracies, the Romans completely stopped trying to rule themselves, because it's so much easier if somebody else does it, and so they had a lot more side-splitting emperors, like the one who made his horse a consul of Rome, which really didn't hurt anything, because consuls didn't have any power anymore, not since the Caesars got it all. And then there was Nero, who fiddled while Rome burned, which indicated that things weren't absolutely completely right for the chosen tribe. What with the barbarians attacking the capital city and all, if you thought about it, that is, which is hard to do, and therefore contrary to Roman philosophy. Chapter 19 And so the Romans came up with a new joke called the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which took a very long time and had everyone rolling in the aisles. For example, the Romans thought it would be pretty funny if the legions that everybody depended on for protection didn't have any Romans in them, but barbarians, since even the plebeians had discovered that being in a legion is hard work and leaves too little time for bread and circuses, which was a hilarious Roman pastime that involved thousands of apes watching gladiators hack each other to pieces, or thousands of apes watching heretics get eaten by lions, or thousands of apes watching practically anything involving lots of blood and death. Chapter 20 The Romans got very good at thinking up new ways to make the decline and fall funnier. For example, they appropriated a new religion called Christianity, which started in a poor Roman province, when a Roman crucified the Messiah, whose name was Jesus, and who believed in love thy neighbor and so forth which was a pretty dangerous idea in Rome, since it isn't always easy to love thy neighbor, especially when you own all thy neighbors, and have killed a lot of their friends and relatives, and are pretty sure they don't love you either. But to pull off a good decline and fall, you have to take some chances, so the Romans decided that they were Christians too, which made it easier to justify not fighting the barbarians, who were sacking Rome every time they thought no one was looking, proving they'd learn a lot from the Romans already. Chapter 21 And so the Romans started going to church a lot, and learning a lot about guilt and suffering and pain, and trying hard to please the new God, who had created everything, all by himself, and therefore had to be capitalized all the time, including pronouns, and who really loved his chosen tribe, which included all the apes, for some reason and he showed his love by sending his only son to earth so that he could be killed by the apes, proving that love thy neighbor is the way to go or something. Nor is this all the Romans learned from Christianity. Chapter 22. For example, they learned that life is not supposed to be easy, but hard, or else you won't go to heaven where everything is perfect, but to hell instead where everything is really lousy and where you're sure to go if you've committed too many sins. They also learned what sin is, 
sin being everything that feels good, which makes it easy to recognize sin, but since nothing is supposed to be easy, it's more complicated than that, which is why it's so important to have priests who can explain everything. Chapter 23 And meanwhile the empire kept declining and falling, as the barbarians kept on appropriating more and more Roman provinces and cities and so forth, not knowing that they were committing a sin by loving things more than God, especially Roman things, which were supposed to be exempt, because Jesus said, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, hadn't he? But the priests explained that it was more complicated than that, which made it all okay, and the empire continued declining and falling for many more volumes. Chapter 24 Then finally, everybody was completely confused and the barbarians were acting like they owned the place, and the Romans were learning a lot every day about sin and guilt and suffering, and the priests were smiling more and more because the barbarians were starting to ask questions about Christianity, and were obviously going to need a lot of help before they got it right. And the emperor was thinking that life might be easier if the capital of Rome weren't Rome, but some other place, maybe farther east, where there weren't quite so many pushy barbarians, and so they closed Rome, and the emperor moved to a new city, named after himself. And the Romans stopped being Romans, and stopped being chosen, and became Italians instead, which is another story altogether, but equally funny in its own right.